Hello, we'll give everyone just a couple of minutes to join and then we'll get started. Hey, good morning, everyone. Um, welcome and thank you for joining us for our webinar, Beneath the Surface, uh, CO2 and Energy Storage for Net Zero, as part of Net Zero Week, the UK's National Awareness Week. My name is Ailey Dunnett. I'm from the British Geological Survey, and I'll be your host today as we take you beneath the surface to explore the key role the subsurface can play in our journey to Net Zero. I'm joined by two of my colleagues today, uh, Dr. Maxine Ackhurst and Ed Huff. Maxine is a principal geologist at the British Geological Survey with extensive experience in offshore and onshore geological survey research and modelling, specialising in CO2 storage research since 2008. Ed is the British Geological Survey's energy storage lead, and he's a geologist with over 25 years of involvement in projects relevant to geoenergy in the UK and internationally including natural gas, hydrogen and compressed air energy research and, and heat storage in the underground. We'll hear from Maxine first, followed by Ed, and there'll be lots of times for, time for questions at the end. So please submit your questions throughout the uh, presentations through the question and answer function um, in Zoom. And without any further ado, let's get started. Over to you, Maxine. Thank you, Ailey. Okay, good morning, everyone. My name is Maxine Ackhurst. I'm a geologist at the British Geological Survey. And today I will introduce our presentation on CO2 and energy storage for our net zero ambitions. Next slide, please. My colleague, Ed and I will review the wide range of UK geological storage resources. We will consider the different types of rock at suitable depths and thicknesses that the UK can use to achieve net zero emissions. We will also look at our wealth of geological resources that can support grid scale amounts of temporary storage of heat, natural gas, compressed air and hydrogen, and permanent storage of CO2. We will then consider that the UK has a very busy subsurface and seabed, and how we might best make use of our subsurface um, so we will need effective planning um, to make best use of our seabed and geological storage resources. Next slide, please. During today's webinar, we will very briefly review the role of the British Geological Survey. Then we will consider where geological storage features in the UK government strategies. Uh, my colleague Ed will review the temporary storage of energy. I will then review UK resources for permanent storage of carbon dioxide. And then finally, the management of UK offshore subsurface and seabed for net zero emissions. Next slide, please. So first, the role of the BGS. We are a non-departmental public body established in 1835. And our role in public um, science is that we provide impartial and independent geoscience advice. We provide the National Repository of Data and Knowledge for UK geoscience. We develop services to make benefit for government, business and the public in the UK. We provide analytical facilities, observatory networks and laboratories, and we deliver UK leadership and make our skills, expertise and knowledge available locally, globally. We undertake research and development in pursuit of these aims. The BGS primarily delivers research products and services, services in the UK, but we also operate internationally to maximise our impact of our science and develop our global standing of our scientists. Next slide, please. We have already mentioned net zero emissions. So what does that mean? So net zero is achieved where the emissions that we remove as a nation are equal to the emissions we produce. If we remove more emissions than we produce, this is described 
as net negative emissions. Where sources of emissions are extremely difficult to remove, net negative technologies are needed to balance them out. To achieve net zero, we must reduce the activities that produce CO2, such as burning coal, acid, gas and oil. We must be efficient with the energy that we do use, regardless of the way that it is generated. And we must use low carbon technologies to ensure that the CO2 that we do produce, such as from industrial processes, is not released to the atmosphere. Next slide, please. Now I'd like to review where the geological storage features in current UK government strategies. Next slide, please. So firstly, I'd like to consider the energy white paper, Empowering our Net Zero for Future, which was published in December 2020. The strategy for decarbonisation of UK industry is focused on clusters, that is, those places where there are large point sources emitting carbon dioxide. Around half of UK em emissions from manufacturing and refining are concentrated in the six clusters shown here. The annual greenhouse gas emissions is measured in equivalent million tonnes of CO2, with the total annual emissions of 35 million tonnes per year from the six clusters shown here. However, the close association of the many large point sources will enable effective Im implementation of low carbon technologies and the economies of scale to reduce the cost of per tonne of CO2 stored. The UK ambition in the Energy White Paper is to deliver four low carbon clusters by 2040, two by the mid 2020s and another two by 2030 with at least one on power generation sources. The greater ambition is for one or more fully net zero clusters by 2040. Next slide, please. The UK Industrial Decarbonisation Strategy was published in 2021. And the decarbonisation activities to achieve net zero are deployment of carbon capture utilisation and storage on industrial sites in clusters, that is to capture and store approximately 3 million tonnes of carbon dioxide per year from the energy intensive industries by 2030. The government will also support increasing amounts of fuel switching to low carbon sources such as hydrogen during the 2020s. And the government will also support electrification for industry during the 2020s. Next slide, please. The UK net zero strategy was also published in 2021. The activities described in the UK strategy, including, including technologies that include the use of natural geological storage resources. These include by decarbonising UK power supply by 2035, by including energy storage, gas fired generation, energy from waste with carbon capture and storage to scale up production of low carbon fuels, for example, including five gigawatts of hydrogen capacity to by 2030. And that has recently been increased to 10 gigawatts in a 2023 policy statement. Now, low carbon hydrogen by industrial processes requires CO2 to be a net zero technology because it produces byproduct carbon dioxide. So decarbonization of industry, um, using CCUS or carbon capture utilisation and storage is intended to deliver four clusters of injury industry CO2 sources by 2030. And the greenhouse gas removals, 5 million tonnes per year by 2030, including bioenergy with carbon dioxide capture and storage and direct air capture uh, with CCS as net negative technologies. Next slide, please. So geology is also needed for the UK hydrogen strategy. The requirement for the hydrogen strategy is laid out in, the, it, it's laid out in this document and it was published in 2021. So hydrogen is a low carbon solution for the UK's energy transition to net zero emissions. It is a highly versatile replacement for the high carbon fuels which we currently use and can be used in domestic and commercial heating and also in transport. Hydrogen will need to be available where and when it is needed. And geological storage will be able to address the difference between the daily and seasonal variation in demand and also the steady state industrial production or fluctuating supply from renewables. 
The focus for the BGS subsurface, or the, the, the focus of the BGS research are for the subsurface storage options in salt caverns and in porous rocks for a future hydrogen infrastructure network. So these are the underground storage in salt caverns, which is an operating technology storing large volumes at low unit cost. The development technology of storage in porous rocks, including depleted gas fields and porous sandstone formations is a research activity that is currently in progress. Next slide, please. Now I'd like to hand over to my colleague, Ed, who will provide an overview and areas of active research in energy storage. Thanks, Max. My name is Ed Huff and I lead the energy storage uh, research topic at the British Geological Survey. And I'll be introducing some of the innovative uses of the bedrock and the subsurface that can support net zero targets using examples of active research currently underway at the British Geological Survey. Next slide, please. Thanks. We've seen that uh, energy storage will be important in supporting government policy regarding decarbonisation. So energy can be stored in different ways and released on different timescales from seconds to months. For example, uh, technologies such as uh, high power flywheels and capacitors can release energy in, in, a seconds, uh, in seconds of duration time. Between sort of seconds and days uh, is a, a space that's occupied by battery storage. And then at, at largest timescales, we have uh, technologies such as pumped hydro, uh, compressed air energy, aquathermal energy storage, mine water storage, and hydrogen storage. And these can um, deploy energy in terms of weeks to seasons. So longer, longer duration energy storage can support the uptake of renewable sources of energy. And these more seasonal discharge technologies have been uh, reviewed in the post note, the UK Parliament Office of Science and Technology, which is uh, illustrated in the picture on the right of the screen. Geological storage is particularly well suited to long duration energy storage. And, uh, but it does bring into, into question how we are using the subsurface because the similar rocks can be used to support different energy storage technologies. So we are working on uh, understanding the use, best use of the subsurface in terms of uh, providing uh, capacity for energy storage uh, locations. So where could energy underground energy storage take place? But also matching capacity and location with supply and demand. Next slide, please. Okay, I thought it'd be useful just to think about how, explaining how a rock um, could store energy or CO2 or air. So one of the most common rock types on, on Earth are sedimentary rock types. And these are made up of small grains of minerals. And uh, between those mineral grains are naturally occurring spaces or voids or pore spaces. So the image on the right shows our uh, grains in different colors. Uh, so these are the grains of sandstone. And between them, we've dyed the, the pore space or the space in the rock blue. So energy can be stored in terms of um, either heat or pressure or chemical um, energy, such as methane or hydrogen, in the naturally occurring pore spaces in rocks. These rocks have a typically large volumes and can give um, slow but consistent discharge and production rates. Next slide, please. So other rock types, as well as sedimentary rocks, can also be used um, to support energy storage. And one of these is a naturally occurring beds of rock salt. So rock salt is a, an interesting geological rock. It, um, it can obviously, it, it dissolves, so it can be dissolved in the subsurface. It flows under geological uh, timescales, and this means it can actually heal itself. So it provides a gas tight um, environment um, where, where, um, where it, voids can be dissolved in, this, in the um, rock salt. So in the, in the UK, caverns can be dissolved in rock salt, and these can be typically 30 to 100 meters high and up to 100 meters in diameter. And 
up to 1,800 meters below the ground. So we're looking at quite significant void spaces that can be engineered in the subsurface. Elsewhere in the world, um, rock caverns can be developed that might be up to 800 meters tall and nearly three kilometers deep. So these caverns, once developed, can allow the rapid injection and production of energy. Uh, next slide, please. So the next, the, or the, the first technology I'll introduce is um, uses sandstones to store and release the heat, heat and cool, naturally heat um, from and cool from the, the subsurface. So the concept is that during summer, and, and looking at the, the image on the right hand side of the, the slide, during the summer where there's a, a need or a demand for cool, cold aquifer waters can be pumped out of aquifers and circulated round buildings and the, um, the air conditioning systems of buildings. And the cold water can absorb um, heat and slowly heat up. And then the warmer water that's produced can then be pumped back into a different part of the aquifer. We might be only looking at a temperature difference of maybe five, 10 degrees centigrade. Now, during winter, the system can be reversed where there is more of a demand for heat. So heat, the hot water or the, the warmer water can then be pumped out of the aquifers, circulated around buildings using heat exchange and heat pumps and cooler water uh, resulting can then be pumped back into cooler parts of the aquifer. So globally, there are nearly, um, there are numerous schemes um, operating at the moment. There are over 3000 schemes in the Netherlands, but only less than two, two, uh, 20 in the UK. So these schemes are suitable for supporting district scale schemes or industrial or leisure um, sort of sites, such as leisure centers, shopping centers or hospitals. So next slide, please. So I mentioned that the, the uptake of this technology is, is fairly low in the UK with under 20 operational schemes. And we're investigating this with colleagues um, from Imperial College in London and at University of Manchester to answer some of the research questions that might enable uh, better and quicker uptake in the UK. So we're looking at where in the UK aquifer thermal energy storage may be possible. We're looking at um, is if aquifer energy uh, storage uh, would be uh, possible in areas of significant demand. And we're looking at what some of the geological controls on heat storage and on storage of cool and on leakage from the systems could be. A big question that we're uh, understanding is how close together schemes could be located and also looking at how stakeholders and um, the, the general public might perceive such schemes and whether or not that represents a barrier to their uptake. Next slide, please. Thank you. So new data is required to improve our confidence in some of these novel energy storage technologies. And to enable this, the British Geological Survey is developing a network of three field sites for research into um, geoenergy. We have a site in Cheshire, which is looking at aquifer thermal energy storage in sandstones. We have a site in Glasgow looking at into mine water heat. And we have a site in Cardiff looking more at the, the urban um, sort of setting for heat storage. We also have improved analytical capability in the shape of core scanners that ca can characterize large volumes of rock. And the aim is to evaluate the long term effect of changing the, the heat and um, character in the subsurface, which can have impacts on the aquifer properties, including the chemistry, the microbiology, and the natural attenuation capacity of the groundwater regime. So this, um, so the, these three different sites are available to support research and can be included in research programs. And further information is available on the web link below, ukgeos.ac.uk. Next slide, please. So just looking in a bit more detail at, at our research site in Cheshire, this is uh, the site that's focusing on heat flow in one of the principal sandstone aquifers in the UK and is aiming to understand better the, the processes and potential for aquifer thermal energy storage. So the concept here is that we have a series of boreholes which have been drilled into the sandstone and hot water can be injected, or cold water in fact, can be injected into boreholes 
and can be monitored by the borehole array around the, um, the heat injection boreholes. So we're looking at really at, at scales of, of about a, you know, a, a small car park, and that's the sort of scale that a scheme um, might have influence over. And we're really interested in understanding whether or not subtle changes in rock affect how the heat is stored, transported and released. We're interested in how far the heat may travel, and we're interested in different flow mechanisms, because, for example, if there are um, fractures in the rock, they may enable heat to flow faster and further in the system. The uh, site also gives us a chance to optimise monitoring strategies to better understand how we can under um, understand and regulate these sorts of systems. Okay, next slide, please. Okay, now let's consider mine water geothermal. So parts of the UK have had a long history of mining and there's leaving a, a legacy of disused and collapsed mine workings. And there's potential for these coal workings to provide a source of heat. So our site that we are, have developed in Glasgow um, is a, a series of boreholes that have been drilled into a, a disused coal mine. And again, these allow, um, allow us to understand the heat flow in a, in a disused mine. So actually it's a, a very sort of novel um, ex experimental facility and it will help us understand the, the resource, the amount of heat that a mine might um, provide and the way that the heat could be released. It allows us to understand the environmental impacts and again develop these monitoring strategies so we can understand exactly how the, um, the heat and the, the extraction of heat or the input of cool into these systems might be affecting the, the subsurface. And it also allows us to develop technologies to sort of uh, optimize and enhance mine water geothermal schemes. Obviously, the, the potential for mine water geothermal is limited to areas of coal mining. So in the UK, we might be looking at areas that have had a, a legacy of, of coal mining, such as central and northern England, um, South Wales and the Midland Valley of Scotland. But there are other smaller coal fields uh, dotted around certain parts of the UK. Next slide, please. Thanks. So now let's take a look at the potential for hydrogen storage. So there's a lot of interest in the value of hydrogen at the moment to support low carbon ambitions. Hydrogen as an element is an effective energy carrier. It has a higher energy storage density when compared to um, technologies such as pumped hydro or compressed air energy, but it has an incredibly low mass. So um, it has a, a very low mass to volume ratio, which means that for the same volume at the same pressure, hydrogen might only represent a quarter to the third of the energy stored by methane, for example. So to replace the amount of energy stored by, by methane, natural gas, we might be looking at a requirement for maybe three to four times the volume of storage in the subsurface. So hydrogen at the moment is, is commercially pr produced through a technology um, called reformation. And this, uh, as a byproduct, uh, produces carbon dioxide. However, there's research underway um, that's looking at the large scale production of hydrogen via hydrolysis, which would be a carbon neutral um, route of, of production. So at the moment, globally, hydrogen is stored in solution mine caverns in just a few places in the world, in uh, parts of the UK and in Texas in the United States. And there's a, there is a question whether or not hydrogen could be stored in porous rocks, which would mean it could be stored in many different locations. Um, initial studies indicate that for the UK, we, we likely have enough energy storage um, capacity in terms of hydrogen storage. Um, in terms of either cavern storage or in porous rock storage. And there is, but there is a question whether or not that's those storage locations would be in the right places to support demand. Some of the um, issues and a review of the state of the art for hydrogen, underground hydrogen storage have been collected in the recently released um, IEA underground hydrogen storage report, which is available from the link at the base of this um, slide and also is illustrated um, to the right of the slide. Next slide, please. Thanks, Ailey. So 
the British Geological Survey have, looking at, have been looking into the potential for the storage of hydrogen porous rocks. The research question we, we have is really looking at whether or not hydrogen, if pumped into the subsurface, would react at different temperatures and pressures with the, the bedrock itself. Um, for example, would there be geochemical or microbial um, reactions that, that would be um, triggered by hydrogen storage itself? So the British Geological Survey is a custodian of, of rock materials for the UK, and we've used some of these, for example, the red sandstones in the, the picture to the right um, in our experiments. And these experiments are part of the full in part of the Industrial Decarbonisation Research and Innovation Centre. And we're working on this project um, with colleagues from the University of Manchester. So next slide, please. So to approach the, the research question, we have developed a laboratory capability that exposes um, what we think might be candidate um, storage uh, rocks. And we can expose these rocks to hyd a hydrogen rich environment at elevated temperatures and pressures. So we've, we've used 50 degrees centigrade, and 150 bar. So these might be representative of some of the, the deeper storage conditions that we might anticipate. And um, our initial uh, indications are that observed changes to any of the rocks, uh, rocks that we've uh, tested in terms of either their structure, composition, or the microbial populations they may support are either very minor or could in fact be related to artifacts of the experiments themselves. So we have further studies underway as part of um, the Industrial Decarbonisation Research and Innovation Centre programme, and these should be reporting uh, at the end of this year. Next slide, please, Ailey. Thanks. So the final technology I'll discuss um, looks at um, using compressed air as a, a store of, of energy. So this is a technology that can use wind and solar power, so renewable sources of energy, to actually compress drive compressors that can then increase the air pressure and then store that air in underground solution mine caverns in rock salt. So when air is compressed, it heats up. So uh, this is called the heat of compression. And a good example of this is um, when you pump up a bike tire, for example, that the valve on the bike tire gets, gets warm. So that's heat of compression. Now this heat of compression can either be um, uh, stored or there are a couple of schemes operational in the world uh, at the moment where this heat is released to the atmosphere, it's vented. If the heat can be stored, then the technology can be a much lower um, carbon uh, technology. So once air is uh, stored at pressure in one of our storage caverns, it, once energy is, is required, the air can be released, the pressure can be released, the um, gas itself needs to be heated up and can be used to drive turbines and provide um, power. So in some scenarios, this would represent a true zero carbon technology. But again, uptake for this technology is fairly low uh, globally. So next slide, please. Thanks. So we're working with uh, colleagues at the University of uh, Loughborough, University of, Le of Leicester and the University of Nottingham. And we're looking at some of the, the questions again um, that might affect uptake of this technology. So we're looking at how system, um, the, the whole energy system design can be optimized. We're looking at the techno-economic assessment. So under what sort of economic or technical uh, conditions uh, might sort of favor um, implementation uptake of this technology. We're looking at the thermal management. So if, if that heat of compression that I mentioned could be actually stored and used later to actually heat the gas up or heat the air up as it's released. We're also considering some of the, the potential for environmental impacts. And we're looking at uh, resource assessment and mapping. So again, where in the UK might the geology be suitable to support these sorts of technology and how much um, energy or uh, could be um, supported by these. Uh, next slide, please, Ailey. Thanks a lot. So by way of conclusion, the UK has got a, a diverse bedrock at depth suitable, suitable to, store, to support many innovative low carbon energy technologies. However, in the UK, the rocks are not the same everywhere and their composition, their depth and thickness will affect their suitability and their ability um, to host different energy storage schemes. 
for example, just thinking of the, the cavern storage, um, which requires um, rock salt um, at suitable depths uh, in the UK, we might be um, thinking of areas such as Cheshire, uh, Teesside, um, but also uh, West Lancashire and Dorset. So these are the sorts of areas onshore that might have um, uh, rock salt in suitable at suitable depths and compositions to support these technologies. Offshore, we might be looking at areas such as the East Irish Sea and the Southern North Sea. Um, so, uh, yeah, fi finally, um, what we can also do is map out some of these areas and get a better understanding of where um, where the halite, uh, where the rock salt um, may be suitable to store um, energy in caverns. So looking at the example on the right hand side of the slide, this is an example from Humberside, and it shows that red areas may be able to store more energy than the yellow areas, uh, just because of the, the character of the rock salt at depth. And in the grey areas, there's no halite or no rock salt, so there's no potential for energy storage. So all these um, areas of research that I've spoken about are active areas of research and um, will be reporting um, over the next uh, few months to years. So with that, I'll now hand over back to Max um, and we can hear about some of the CO2 storage work that the Geological Survey is involved in. Thanks. Thank you, Ed. I'd now like to consider the research on the permanent geological storage of CO2 and areas of active BGS research. Next slide, please. So in the view of the UK Climate Change Committee, CO CO2 capture and permanent storage is seen as a necessity, not an option, to the UK achieving its net zero ambitions by 2050, which was published in 2020, and the report is shown here on the right of the slide. So the carbon capture and storage ambition in the UK to achieve the net zero strategy is the annual capture and permanent storage of CO2 of up to 30 million tonnes per year, including 6 million tonnes to, de to de decarbonize industry processes by early 2030. The ambition includes at least 50 million tonnes per year by the mid 2030s. The ambition also includes the removal of greenhouse gas from the atmosphere by direct care air capture of CO2 and biomass mass energy, both with carbon capture and storage of at least 5 million tonnes per year by 2030. So the big question for us is then, does the UK have sufficient CO2's permanent storage capacity to meet this ambition. Next slide, please. So in our role, um, our beat as the national provider of UK geoscience, we host, own and develop the UK national CO2 storage database, CO2 stored. The data in the, in the database um, has information, detailed information on more than 570 prospective offshore storage units around the UK. The sites are here shown on the map. The centre points are shown by the geographical position as these open circles. The type of store and the capacity are indicated by the colour and the size of the circles respectively. The stores are, that are shown in brown are depleted hydrocarbon fields and the stores that are shown in, in blue are in the saltwater sandstones or saline aquifers that Ed has been discussing. The database contains much detailed information on each, including calculation of theoretical storage capacity. And the database has been the starting point for industry CO2 storage projects. I'd like you to be aware that the CO2 storage has been in operation at two sites for more than two decades by our near neighbours, Norway. For example, next slide please. The Sleipner CO2 injection project shown in this green circle has been storing 1 million tonnes per year since 1996, so a total of 25 million tonnes and so a tried and tested technology. Note the geographical distribution of the storage sites, storage units that have been mapped here and that notice that it was very similar to the distribution of the rock salt formations and the porous strata that Ed has been showing you um, earlier in the presentation. 
Next slide, please. So here we have seen the map of prospective CO2 storage units around the UK. So what does CO2 store tell us about the UK CO2 storage resource? Well, I think first of all, we can say that we do have sufficient theoretical storage capacity. The summed, summed UK theoretical capacity is 78,000 million tonnes of CO2, that is 78 gigatons. The pie charts on the left illustrates that the UK capacity is predominantly within saltwater sandstones or saline aquifers, which is shown by this very large blue sector. The pie chart on the right shows that the capacity is mostly within underlying the North Sea, and this is the purple, green and orange sectors shown on the right hand pie chart. We can see from this that the capacity that we have, uh, it significantly exceeds UK ambition to store between 30 and 50 million tonnes per year. The suitability of porous sandstones and depleted gas fields is also being assessed for hydrogen storage, as we have heard from Ed. So the BGS research considers where and how UK CO2 can be permanently stored for decarbonisation of UK power generation and clusters of, in, uh, clusters of, of industry. So I'd like to review some of the sort of research that is currently underway on the geological formations around the UK, and we will focus in on the Southern North Sea, as this is an area that is planned for storage by two of the UK industrial clusters. The, 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 um, the UK government has undergone a, a cluster sequencing activity and two of their most, um, most um, forward thoughts are that the, the Teesside and Humberside industrial clusters are part of their track one cluster that is part of their ongoing support. And so BGS research is looking at the mapping on modeling of CO2 storage in the Bunter sandstone, which is where the two clusters are planning to store their, their CO2. In this map, on the right hand side of our slide, we can see the extent of the Bunter sandstone uh, offshore the eastern coast of England. And in it, we can see zones uh, in the Bunter sandstone, which are defined by geological faults and structures shown on this map, either in red or blue, black. So BGS are mapping and modeling CO2 storage to investigate whether the boundaries between these zones are open or closed to flow in the subsurface. Next slide, please. So I'd like to look at um, work undertaken, it's current work undertaken by BGS colleagues. And this is to look at the, in the effect of injection of CO2 and how that has an impact on the, on the pressure within the geological formation. And we are looking at two end members here. We are considering if the boundaries are entirely open and the zones are in hydraulic con continuity, or whether the other end member that they are closed to flow. So the pressure will determine how much CO2 can be stored and at what rate it can be stored. So if we look at the two examples, the image on the, on the left is where there's open to flow, the increase in pressures is, 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 is relatively low associated with each of those colored injection points. On the other hand, if the boundaries are entirely closed to flow, you can see that the, um, the, uh, the are higher, they are more, the increase in pressure, so the CO2 injection is higher. And this is shown where there are brighter colors and also where these, where there are the circles are shown highlighted by the circles. So the, where the pressure is increased, there will be less storage capacity and the rate of injection will be lower. Next slide, please. Another of the, uh, the activities is that BGS, British Geological Survey and UK Research and Innovation are scoping a UK CO2 storage research facility. This is, is to support research in terms of site characterization, injection, monitoring and post-injection site closure. The, the, uh, the science case for the facility comprises knowledge gaps and science challenges that have been identified by our stakeholder community. The knowledge gaps are listed here. 
These include long-term storage efficiency to improve security and reduce risks and costs. What are the effects of different subsurface geological processes at scale? How the cost-effective monitoring and conformance technologies? Environmental research and strategic management, and very importantly, social attitudes to local hosting of a major net zero infrastructure. So the science challenges are the outstanding research questions, the how and what questions. How can we improve efficiency of storage? How much CO2 is trapped by each of those mechanisms? How can we make monitoring more cost effective? And how can we understand social attitudes to net zero infrastructure? And the science case is presentedly presented in a publicly available report, downloadable at this address. Next slide, please. So we have seen, by comparing the different maps shown by Ed and myself, there are common areas of suitability for hydrogen storage in salt and sandstones that are suitable for CO2 or hydrogen storage. Now I'd like to review ongoing research on the use of UK geological storage resources for the energy transition in the Managing Offshore Energy Transition or the MOE project. Next slide, please. So MOE is the UK's first holistic study of the environmental and social impacts resulting from the rapid expansion of offshore infrastructure. And this is driven by the UK's energy transition to net zero emissions. The research is funded by the Natural Environment Research Council and is started in 2022 and is of five years duration. The research is conducted by three UK research institutes, the British Geological Survey, Plymouth Marine Laboratory, and the National Oceanography Centre in Southampton. Next slide, please. So the research activities are to address the effective and optimal use of the subsurface geological resources for temporary hydrogen and permanent CO2 storage. So these are the characteristics at the bottom of the column uh, shown on the right of our slide. We are also looking at the environmental and sustainability of offshore energy infrastructure, also understanding the impact of activities of the shallow subsurface, seeps and the marine environment. So this is the shallow subsurface and the seabed in the midpoint in our column on the right. Very importantly, the societal consequences of the energy transition. That is the topmost surface in this column, with an important activity to translate our scientific research into stakeholder-led outcomes to support decision-making. Next slide, please. So wherever you look around the UK, the offshore UK is already very busy, both in terms of the seabed and in the subsurface. When considering the transition to low carbon technologies, we have to consider existing activities and also new uses, those new low carbon technologies for net zero. And as we have seen, these include temporary storage of hydrogen in engineered salt caverns, temporary storage of hydrogen in porous strata, the permanent storage of carbon dioxide in porous strata, and the installation at the seabed of offshore wind farms. We also need to consider existing activities such as natural, natural gas production and subsurface storage of natural gas. In our work for the MOE project, we were considering not only the physical interaction of the storage facilities themselves, but their infrastructure, but also their operation. So what is the impact of uh, seasonal storage? So recharge and discharge for hydrogen and permanent storage for the pressure of injection for carbon dioxide. So in our project, we will be addressing the synergies and also how we can minimize conflicts of subsurface and seabed use. Next slide, please. So we have seen earlier that the UK industrial decarbonization is the, are, are, are in industry clusters. And these are also the focus for the MOE research. And this has helped us to define three areas of interest. In the industrial cluster sequencing event um, are the track one industry clusters, and these are Humberside and Teesside, 
in the Southern North Sea. So that is our area run one to the east of the UK. Um, Hynet in the Liverpool Bay area. So our area two to the west of the UK. And the reserve cluster, which is Acorn in Scotland. So our area two in the north east of the UK. Our initial work has been in area one and we have been investigating the subsurface and the seabed for its low carbon technology uses. And the importance is that the activities are fully integrated to enable us to consider the synergies and to minimize conflicts of use. Next slide, please. I think one of the challenges of the energy transition to me is evident in the mapping of store strata in the Southern North Sea. And here we are offshore Teesside and Humberside in this map. The proposed and consented wind farms are shown in blue and purple. The prospective CO2 storage units are shown in pink. The proposed and consented CO2 storage license areas are shown in shades of green. Their extents at the seabed or different depths below it show very clear overlap. So the mapping of sites for CO2 storage is in salt caverns, CO2 and hydrogen storage in porous rocks is in progress, and we are modelling of the storage operations to inform management to address synergies and minimise conflicts of use. So I'd like them to move my, my last slide. So we have seen in our presentation, presentation today that the UK has a very wide range of natural geological storage resources. The variety of UK bedrock types at suitable depths and thicknesses can support our progress to, to achieve net zero. Our geological resources can store a variety of technologies and store grid scale amounts of heat, of natural gas, compressed air, hydrogen, and in permanent storage of carbon dioxide. We have seen that the UK has a very busy offshore subsurface and seabed, and that there are overlapping geological storage forces and seabed wind farms. And there will be, we will need to have effective planning of subsurface and seabed use to ensure the best use of UK natural geological resources. Next slide, please. So thank you very much for your attention. We will be pleased to answer questions. Do put your questions using the webinar Q&A facility. Thank you very much. Hey, thank you, Maxine and Ed. So we have a few questions to get us started, but if you have any more questions, we've got plenty of time to answer them. So please do put them um, into the Q&A function. So I'll start off with a question um, for Ed. This question comes from Simon. Uh, which fluid would you use to store energy underground? And what is your opinion about storing dissolved CO2 in this fluid to combine geothermia and carbon sequestration? Okay, thanks, uh, thanks, Ellen. Thanks, Simon, for the, the question. I think in terms of what which fluids could be used to, to store energy, um, the options are um, you could store thermal energy in, in groundwaters, so that'll be water. You could store mechanical energy. Um, so um, you can store mechanical energy in terms of uh, air as a fluid. So you can compress the air that I mentioned. And you can also store chemical energy in, the, in terms of um, things like uh, methane or hydrogen. Um, so there's different ways of, of storing energy in the subsurface, mechanical, thermal and, and chemical. Um, whether or not they could be um, linked with CO2 storage, I think is a more of a difficult question. Yeah. Um, I don't know if Max, if you could. Yeah, so I'm aware from work that's research that's been done in Switzerland. This isn't, um, this isn't being considered, um, Sam, in the UK to the best of my knowledge, uh, unless Ed knows better, um, but CO2 has been considered as a medium for as a as a for in a in geothermal. So to to um, gain sub heat from the subsurface, not using mine water, um, as, as Ed has been, has been in, is indicating, um, but it has been using CO2 um, as a medium for your, to transfer the geoth geothermal energy. But it's not something that we are considering that I know of in the UK. 
Great. We'll move on to a question from Sam. He says, thanks for the interesting talk. Um, are there any risks or barriers associated with hydrogen use as a fuel that may prevent its widespread use in the future? Yeah, I could, I could um, make a start with the, the question. So thanks, Sam, for the, the question. Um, in terms of hydrogen storage, um, hydrogen can um, in brittle steel, so you can get brittle failure of steel um, if it's if the steel is, for example, from an old old borehole completion or casing. So there would need to be an assessment of whether or not any old boreholes intersect your storage complex. Um, there are regulations in place um, for use of hydrogen in domestic use as a, as a blend with natural gas. Um, in terms of subsurface storage, again. Um, there could be risks from leakage, although it's it's useful to point out that there have been no exam no documented examples of leakage from a storage cavern itself. There have been leakages from the boreholes connecting the surface to the cavern, but not from the, the cavern itself in terms of um, halite uh, cavern storage. Um, there is a potential for reactions um, in porous storage, so that storage of hydrogen in sandstones, in terms of geochemistry or in terms of microbial um, activity. And both of those could either affect the, um, the quality of the, the hydrogen that could be um, extracted from the storage medium, or indeed um, affect the, the performance of the reservoir itself. Um, and in terms of, um, yeah, the there are commercial risks as well um, in association with retrieval of um, stored product. Um, so yeah, there are several risks. Um, this is um, falls into the the remit of um, the work that the the IEA um, have been looking at on um, underground hydrogen storage, and uh, I'd link back to the the report from the um, International Energy Authority on underground hydrogen storage that I mentioned previously. And that gives a, a good review of current understanding on that. Thank you. A question for Maxine now. This is a question from Chris who says. Maybe a silly question, um, there's no such thing, but uh, how well contained are CO2 storage sites? For instance, how likely is CO2 to escape some of these storage sites through some kind of geological movement or diffusion stroke bleed out? Okay, the, it's not a silly question at all, Chris. It's a very good one. And this is part of the work. When we are talking about management, uh, I've mentioned management several times, but how we would manage what we were doing the subsurface is to ensure that the sort of examples that you give that sort of there might be geological or, mu or movement this is exactly the type of work that we do as a geological sur um, survey uh, for um, for commercial projects what they do the same thing for their own projects they look at the how what the maximum pressure is. We looked earlier on in some of the slides that I'd shown you um, how this pressure of injection uh, might cause a cause the an increase in the reservoir pressure. And so we are, we understand so we have the benefit of of many years of hydrogen you know, hy hydrogen hydrocarbon production, both gas and oil, to and for us to understand the character of the geological formations, whether they're fields or they're host formations. And we can have a look at the maximum limits and then we put a safety factor on it and then we, then we simulate it and then you compare it with um, oil and gas exploration for production figures. And so individually projects look at those very carefully uh, and make sure that they fall within the pressure limits. And for us as a geological survey, we look at the regional picture. So there's illustrations that I showed earlier to say, well, if there's more than one project in a sandstone, what happens if there's a cumulative effect? And we then examine the character of the bounty boundaries or not between projects to ensure that this careful, very careful management of the subsurface um, is maintains it in a secure, it's securely in the subsurface. And we have the benefit of decades of the experience from the oil and gas sector. And we can not only use their experience and their data and their knowledge to be able to ensure that the um, there should be no geological movement, there will be no geological movement um, and, um, to ensure that the CO2 stays securely in the subsurface. Thank you, Maxine. So a question for Ed, actually two questions from Paul. Uh, which countries are seen as a leader in new storage technologies? 
and also building on the theme of leakage, how much are we looking at that and does this risk reducing future investments? Yeah, thanks uh, Paul for the questions. Um, first of all, thinking about um, areas, um, countries which might be leaders in different um, technologies. Um, so the, the geology, not just the geology in the UK, but the geology between different countries is different. So different countries can support, you know, the geology of different countries can support different technologies. Um, so not all technologies are could be sort of deployed and supported everywhere. However, we've got a really good um, track record globally in underground gas storage, so that's storage of methane in caverns. So this has been um, operating since the 1960s in different places. And this gives us a really good evidence base on um, understanding sort of cavern performance. Um, so uh, underground gas storage is um, carried out in you know, several areas in, in the world. So um, the UK has several facilities, um, places like uh, Northwest Europe, so France, um, Germany, uh, Poland, Netherlands. Thinking just about hydrogen storage, there are only two locations in the world that have operational cavern storage of hydrogen, and that is at Teesside in the UK and also Texas, so that those could be considered sort of leaders in underground hydrogen storage in caverns. Thinking about compressed air energy, uh, there's only been a couple of pilot um, projects uh, in the world. One is um, in Huntdorf in Germany, and there's also Macintosh uh, in Alabama in the US. And then looking at the, the thermal storage, um, looking at the thermal, as I mentioned, the, the Netherlands is, is you know, head and shoulders above in terms of, of schemes that are operational, but they're also, uh, there are also operational schemes in, um, for example, um, Denmark, um, Sweden, UK has got a couple of schemes. Um, so there are schemes and there, there are areas that could be used as to, to sort of learn from. And just remind what this, the second part of the question was, Ailey. Um, it was, um, how much are we looking at leakage and does this risk reducing future investments? I think, as, a, as I said previously, leakage from a, from a cavern itself hasn't been reported, but they, there have been incidents where, where there's been leakage from boreholes that connect caverns to the surface. So that would be one area to, to look at. Leakage from porous um, strata. So if we're looking at um, using depleted gas fields, these are areas of, of you know, they could be sandstones that have in the past uh, contained natural gas. So there, there is work underway to understand um, the conditions where, um, the conditions that would need to be met for those to, um, to, to either contain or not hydrogen. So, um, in terms of leakage, um, you know, there are processes or risk assessments that can be done to understand that. Um, but you know, it, it might be a consideration in, in some scenarios, but you know, there'd be research that could um, be carried out to, to address that question. Thank you. We've got two interesting questions here on a slightly different theme, looking at skills. Um, one from an anonymous attendee, are there technical geoscience skills that are required for this emerging area that are not already used or focused on in traditional geoscience industries such as oil and gas? Um, and another similar question from Corey, um, how would a geology graduate get involved um, or work on subsurface hydrogen or CO2 storage in the UK? Would you like to take that one to start off with, Max? Okay. I'm looking for the question. Sorry, Ailey, I'm looking for the question. That's okay. So are there technical geoscience skills that are required for this area that are not already used in traditional oil and gas industries? And how can a graduate get involved in these areas? Okay, so they so it's very much the um using the sort of skills that have been have been developed in the past um, on the experience of oil and gas. But really, but, the, but technically, it is slightly different. So it is adapting the skills that have been developed in the past. Of course, we are injecting uh, rather than producing. Uh, so there will be um, skills that are needed in terms of the reservoir. We are concerned that we are not have enough people coming into our into our industry who are 
you see the perhaps the end of a, a hydrocarbon um, extraction activity, there will be an overlap, of course, but we need the skills, the skills. So as, to the best of my knowledge, um, the skills are, as we have understood previously, both the practical and the geoscience and the interpretation and the sort of engineering skills, but these are not quite the same as in the, 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 the operations themselves um, are, um, are, are a little different. There are, there, so in terms of how do you get into it, uh, there are several, um, there are several uh, courses on CO2 capture and storage that are run by universities. There's one I know I'm based in Edinburgh and there's one by um, there's one based at University of Edinburgh, but there are other university courses as well. Um, so in answer to your question, yes, please do. <laughs> please do engage where you can, you know, if you if you wish to then engage in any of these postgraduate educations, the opportunities. And I'm not aware that there are any different skills. There are, however, different, there will be adaptation and different use of the skills that we have already learned. I'll just add in there that um, BGS does take them graduates as well, and we have, uh, we'll be running an open call each year as well. Um, okay, a question for Ed um, around fractures and their influence um, on flow through sandstone. So this is from Mark, and, and he says that fractures do influence flow through sandstones. GS and I are looking at this in the Sherwood sandstone in Northern Ireland. What work are BGS doing to characterize such structures? Yeah, thanks. Thanks, Mark, for the, the question. Um, when looking at um, thermal, thermal storage in aquifers and potential for fracture flow in sandstones, we will be using the, um, the UK Geoenergy Observatory at Cheshire that I described, which is a series of boreholes accessing the Sherwood sandstone as well. And in those boreholes, we will be um, carrying out uh, thermal trace and thermal response tests in the boreholes. So essentially, we'll be heating up um, the borehole and then monitoring the thermal plumes um, away from those boreholes. So what we what we anticipate to see will be faster and further migration of heat along fractures and then more of a, a contained migration of heat closer to boreholes. So that's one of the ways that we're, we'll be looking at uh, potential for fracture flow in the, the shallow, the shallower parts of the Sherwood sandstone. Thanks. Um, great, a question for Maxine then. Um, this is from Glyn. Where in the UK is um, the UK CO2 storage research facility likely to be based? Um, and are BGS aware of the work conducted um, by CO2 CRC in Otway in Australia? So, so thank you, Glenn. Yes, we very are very much aware of the of the CO2 storage facility in in Australia. So I'd mentioned that um, we are building the science case, and our science case has been engaging our stakeholders. We've got to say it was a big thank you to all of the the pilot sites, the research sites around the world who have been helpful, who have been very helpful, including CO2 CRC in in Otway, Australia. So looking at what they do and what we are proposing, they, their, site, um, their site injects a mixture of gases. It doesn't just include CO2. And we are then looking at how we can work um, in a complementary way. So their work is onshore. Our, our, our UK plans are for storage offshore. So the monitoring technologies will be different. And so, yes, we have taken account of all of the pilot sites around the world. And big thank you to everybody who was so cooperative and helpful. So it is likely to be based in terms of a CO2 storage research facility. It is likely to be based in those strata that are planned for CO2 storage by UK commercial projects. And as we have seen, the commercial projects for, say, Teesside and Humberside or for um, Hynet in Liverpool Bay, and they are both based in Northern England. And so that is where this more, the facility is more likely to be, to be based. Thank you. Okay, a question for Ed on storage cavern formations. This is from Chris. Can the storage cavern formations withstand the magnitude of pressures from hydrogen or compressed air? And what technologies will be used to monitor for faults um, in the cavern formations? Yeah, thanks. Um... Chris for the question. So we're we're lucky um, with cavern storage in that we have a, 
as I mentioned, we have a, a long, or glo globally, we have a, a long, um, a long history of cavern storage dating back to 1960s. And this gives us a really good understanding of some of the mechanical and engineering parameters that allow safe storage. Um, so for example, as a, as a rule of thumb, and this would be then applied um, individually at different um, schemes, de depending on the local geology, but as a rule of thumb, the, the schemes would have a maximum storage pressure of 80% of the lithostatic pressure, so that's the pressure of the rocks above. So you wouldn't want to um, exceed 80% of the lithostatic pressure as a, as a rule of thumb. And this means that you would um, typically avoid any fracturing of the rock or any, any potential for gas to escape through, through halite. However, there are questions, there are definitely are questions about whether or not storage of hydrogen would operate at um, time scales that are shorter than seasonal. So would we be looking at the potential for higher storage pressures and higher, um, higher rates of withdrawal and injection? And that, those are areas that um, are areas of, of current research, um, looking at the, the behavior of, of rock salt at those um, different mechanical conditions. Thank you. A question for Maxine from Rochelle. When you're mapping and modeling the fault boundaries in the Bunter sandstone to consider if the boundaries are open or closed, do you plan to consider the future impacts of climate change, i.e. overburden pressure from glaciation and how this may impact fluid flow? Okay, one of the things I think we've got to consider there is time scale. So when you consider the planning and modeling of CO2 storage injection and storage, you then um, you would then have to then consider how um, how long it would take in terms of the the trapping trapping mechanisms. So one of the things, one of the main characteristics, and you you all know this. I don't know whether you drink Coca Cola, tonic water, or champagne. You all know that CO two goes into solution under pressure. Pick your pick your one. Um, so one of the main trapping mechanisms for CO2 in draft or injection is that it dissolves extremely quickly under pressure. So in terms, of, I mean, that is, it is very, very rapid, um, but both in real time and in terms of geological time. And then we look to see how much the, the, the character of the stored CO2 changes over, over time scales. And our objective then is to see over tens of years, hundreds of years and thousands of years to see what happens to the CO2. So the CO2 would initially, um, it would dissolve, some of the buoyant gas would rise upwards, some of the gas is, is trapped between the pores as residual trapping, and some of it remains as free gas. But our modeling shows that the free gas, the gas cap, gradually decreases in the over periods of, of a few thousand years. So in terms of the impacts of climate change, and your indication here is, is overburden pressure from glaciation. By looking at the past, we have seen that glaciation takes place over not just thousands of years, but tens of thousands of years. So in terms of the time scales, uh, the, the stored CO2 um, would either be in terms of dissolved um, or it would be, it would eventually form minerals, calcite minerals within the pores within the rock. So it's a time scale difference. However, you are right, we have thought of this, um, the impact of climate change into, into the overburden pressure from glaciation, and also the past overburden pressure retaining from glaciation. And I believe in part uh, is there is a project called the Sharp Project, which is investigating some aspects of this work, but there is quite a disparity, Rochelle, in terms of the timescales. Thank you, Maxine. Um, a question for Ed. Is formation of scale or corrosion due to salts a problem for heat storage when using water circulated into the subsurface? Okay, thanks for the, the question. Um, I think that for the, the aquifer thermal energy um, systems that I've been talking about, we're talking about very low enthalpy, so low changes in, in actual temperature. So, um, I can't think of any instances where salt corrosion has been an, an issue at those temperatures. It could potentially be more of an issue at the higher temperatures or at the hotter, uh, drier rock 
uh, temperatures, but that's not an area of my expertise. So I'd, I'd, I wouldn't be comfortable commenting on it, but yeah, so I won't say no, but certainly at the, at the lower temperatures, I, 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 would, I wouldn't think that's one of the main considerations there. Thanks. Another question, I think, for you here, Ed. The IEA Hydrogen TCP Task 42 UHS report, it's not the title, um, provides an overview of the uh, TRLs for different UHS technologies. Um, fast cyclic salt caverns are shown to have a TRL of five to six. What are your views of the potential challenges of fast cycling salt caverns in UK environments? And do you see this solution developing to a TRL 9 to 11, which is a commercial operation and a maturity um, in the near future? Yeah, thanks for the, for the question. That, that refers back to the, the um, International Energy Agency report that I was uh, mentioned uh, previously. So I think that the challenges for fast cycling caverns will be, um, firstly, whether or not the geology provides a barrier to that. So uh, can caverns be located at particular depths that can, with the mechanical envelope that can support fast cycling without um, failure of the of the cavern walls? So that's that's really a, a point that could be modelled. We could look at modelling that. Um, however, it's it's probably more of a, you know, a technical challenge, um, whether or not the we can have uh, compressors that can um, carry out fast cycling at that sort of at its cavern sort of scale, and also the the economics. You know, our, our, have we got our rock salt in the right areas to support? Um, the sort of demand if if fast cycling is is required. So I think that there is um, potential. Um, there are some questions which will need to be addressed, um, but it's it's definitely you know operating caverns in a different way is is definitely something that uh, more than one research group is looking at at the moment. So thanks. Okay, thank you. Another question um, for Maxine. This is similar to some questions we've had about leakage. So in a porous medium like sandstone, what's the likely leakage of CO2 and therefore the likely danger of effectively turning the North Sea into a big um, carbonic acid sink? Um, but then also a second part of this question, how would you mitigate against shortcuts taken by companies in the interest of profits or just getting ahead in the market? Um, in the future that put the climate at risk and the geological safety of the seabed at risk. So any thoughts on regulation there? Okay, so one of the things at the moment, of course, is that um, with uh, more CO2 in the air, this is increasing. This is not uh, this is not a, ge a this is not a geology um, um, a research issue. This is sort of a general concern: is that there's more CO2 in the air and it is causing ocean acidification anyway. So in terms of our our concern, our important part is to make sure, it, literally, that it does does not leak. So this is where it's very carefully looking at the um, at the subsurface. Now you mentioned um, in your question. Um, that you're turning the North Sea into a big carbonic acid sink. So what we're looking at is the groundwater in the subsurface, at least at least 800 meters beneath the seabed. So one of the um, one of the activities then is to make sure that it stays in the subsurface, as oil and gas have done for you know million geological timescales, millions of years. So it is not to make it leak to the CO2. So one of the questions I'd answered earlier on is that what happens to the CO2? So the CO2 does go into solution as in a fizzy drink. And there's the brine. Um, so it's all, it's all very in at depths, at groundwater at depths is not drinkable water. It's very salty or brine. And so what happens is when the CO2 dissolves in the brine at depths greater than or much greater than, say, 800 or 1,000 metres beneath the subsurface, the brine becomes more dense. And so the dense, the dense brine containing the CO2 sinks down rather than upwards. So this is a sort of a modeling and then eventually a modeling activity for us as geology as scientists, and eventually it becomes precipitates as, as minerals. So in part, in terms of leakage, this is very important from both companies and from us as the sort of representatives of the public for public science that the CO2 does not leak. That is the main objective of our, of our work. And then I'm trying to think of the answer of the question for how would you mitigate 
shortcuts taken by companies. Well, I would say that part of the regulation that is set in the, in the legislation initially by the EU storage directive, but also as transposed into UK law, is that the monitoring of the storage sites and the careful consideration of mitigating activities and corrective measures, if there's any indication that, the, that these stores are not operating as they should do, then that is the regulator's job to enforce that very, very careful and very thorough um, monitoring of conformance of operation. So, in, you know, I, I believe that there is sufficient regulation in the UK to ensure that there are no such things as shortcuts taken by companies. In part, one of the objectives is to demonstrate to the regulator that the store is operating, that it is perfectly and can, it is well contained and is, and is securely held in the subsurfaces because they cannot hand it, they cannot close the site until they are able to demonstrate that clearly to the regulator. So I don't think that we're putting the seabed at risk by consider, considering carefully our subsurface operations, monitoring and conformance of those operations. Thank you. A question uh, related to that um, in terms of regulation. Has regulation kept up with carbon storage developments and who are the key parties involved in regulating the sector? Okay, so in answer to that question, we, are, we, are, we work very closely with the regulators. So you may be aware or you may perhaps not. Um, so one of the maps that I showed you um, earlier in my talk was that there are areas identified for CO2 storage. Now, the UK is the first country to do this. Um, the first one was uh, the first CO2 storage licensing round. Previously, we've been with, uh, with oil and hydrocarbon, oil and gas licensing rounds. Now, the North Sea Transition Authority now have CO2 storage licensing rounds. Um, they work, BGS, the Geological Survey, works very closely with the um, with, the, with the North Sea Transition Authority. Um, so in terms of has the regulation kept up with storage developments? Yes, I believe it has. Uh, in terms of that aspect, um, are the key aspects of the key parties involved? So that would be that would be mostly the North Sea Transition Authority, but it would also be working with the Crown Estate Scotland or, or the Crown Estate. And then you would also be looking for those onshore parts of your project that would be the environment agency and also you would have to consider the marine management organization and the very importantly of course the health and safety executive so i think there's a a, a wealth and that's just there are more regulators that are involved that's just the sort of key ones so i hope that helps you with your key parties involved in regulation thank you okay another question on co2 storage for you maxine um, which they say may be another silly question, definitely not. Um, but perhaps, I guess this is to um, a wider public audience, perhaps they need a reassurance that pressured CO2 storage is not going to lead to the same effects as fracking for gas. So can we be sure of this? Okay, one of the things that we had mentioned earlier um, was the sort of pressure modeling of pressure of injection. And we'd also then, as, as Ed has said, both for hydrogen and for CO2 storage, as, you know, um, establishing clear limits of what the maximum pressure should be. So when you have fracking, that's when the pressure has been exceeded. And so we keep, as Ed says, within certain limits, accepted limits, and then with safety factors to ensure that the um, that the there should not be any fracturing and the modeling that we showed you earlier on. I've mentioned earlier on about the um, conformance, monitoring for conformance and um, conformance of you know, seismicity. So using micro seismometers to uh, demonstrate that, this, that, the, that there should not be um, micro seismic events that might indicate that fracking, fracturing, I wouldn't call it fracking. I would say we, would do, we wouldn't ignore what I say at fracturing is to make sure that there should be no um, none of that sort of seismic activity takes place, that we stay within the acceptable limits uh, within the, with the established for each individual site, which are individual, you know, which is set individually on the characteristics of the rocks and the, and the existing, um, what, what, as, as I had has described, the lithostatic, lithostratigraphic, sorry, lithostatic pressure, sorry. <laughs> Hope that um, reassuring is, is a little bit reassuring. Great. OK, so we've got 10 minutes left and we've got 10 open questions. So let's see if we can get through those. Um, so on a slightly different topic, where does the long term liability of CO2 storage sit? 
okay, this is very straightforward. Um, so in terms of the, the sort of conformance for monitoring, um, when the operator um, has reassured the, the national regulatory authorities that, these, that after they've completed st um, their storage operations, after sufficient time with there is of monitoring equipment to demonstrate that there, there are, the store is operating, is performing in the way that they have predicted, uh, only then will then that be handed over to what's called the competent authority. So that will be the appropriate um, government department. I mean, this is so far in the future, I'm not sure that one has been identified, uh, but nevertheless, it will be taken over by the government. And you say, isn't this, you know, isn't this new? No, it de definitely isn't. Um, for example, this is where the role of the, of where coal mines, uh, the ownership of coal mines has, for example, been taken over by the coal authority. So that is where, it, when the, site has been demonstrating as being completely safe, stable, and suitable to be completely closed, then that, then that um, liability then will go on to the competent authority, which will be a UK government department. Thank you. Okay, two questions from Mark here. Um, you've talked about lots of storage, offshore storage potential um, in the UK, but what about onshore? And also, is BGS looking at uh, CCS through rock mineralization, particularly in basalts or other um, igneous rocks? Okay, so, so, so we know our offshore storage potential from the data sets and the knowledge that we have from, from the oil and gas industry. So we, in terms of the subsurface, um, we, we know the subsurface offshore uh, where it has been used for oil and gas production far better than we know it onshore because of the very detailed seismic data sets. Also, because of the character of the rocks themselves, on the whole, um, the rocks offshore tend to be younger, more porous and less faulted. So they're more of an attractive proposition um, than, um, than for storage, than sort of the older, more fractured rocks. There is still the possibility of storing them onshore. It's not something that we've assessed. Um, however, the question is being asked because if somebody is isolated from the coast and they have a CO2 storage source um, and they are away from another project, then somebody is of interest. I'm not sure that the legislation um, has completely gone through. So we were talking about the regulatory requirements and the regulators that are assigned. Um, talking to the regulators, I'm not sure that the regulatory steps have all been completely um, closed in terms of making a sequence of the regulations that an operator might might follow so um so there so there there is storage potential onshore um but for the most part it is not at the scale of of the storage capacities nor at the rates of which we can do injection that we can we that we need to do to meet meet next zero we saw that map that's got sort of millions of tons per year from each one of those, those industrial clusters. We've got to think big and act big. Um, but in the future, perhaps, um, where we are looking to those hard to reduce sources that are isolated, perhaps we would use onshore sites. And then I think you've got can another- just, Can I just add to that? Yeah, go away, Ed, go, go ahead. I think it's, it's quite interesting um, and it's quite it, useful to actually contrast co2 storage which is permanent or should be permanent with energy storage which is temporary and it might mean that you know some of the more remote locations that are offshore might be less suited for energy storage um and some of the, the more onshore um sources of of storage which might be located closer to sites of demand might be better suited for for temporary energy storage so thinking about you know demand really is, is quite a, a useful um, useful way of trying to understand where storage might be needed. And so the second part, I think there was a second part of the question. So uh, um, so to Mark here, so is, uh, is BGS looking at carbon capture and storage through rock mineralization, particularly in basalts? Um, uh, so we are well aware from the carbon fix project in Iceland of the, um, of the characteristics of the rocks that they are doing. So they are going straight to rock mineralization. Um, it is relatively small scale. It's in the hundreds to thousands of tons per year, but we are looking to use the rocks that we have 
um, and in the question that Mark has as well. But the Icelanders, they have plenty of very fresh basalt. They're very, very, very new um, in terms of geological terms, very new indeed. And so they're quite reactive to the carbon dioxide um, that's inserted in the sort of fractures and the buggy paces that are within the basalt. So the, B, so the BGS mapping work will have mapped basaltic rocks and other basic rigmeous rocks all around the UK. But Mark, they don't offer the same attractiveness in terms of the size and the scale of CO2 storage by mineralization. Also, for the most part, the, the UK basaltic rocks are, tend to be quite a bit older, even the sort of tertiary provinces in the sort of the, the, the sort of the outer isles and the western part of Scotland. But for the most part, basaltic rocks of Carboniferous age um, tend to be a lot more weathered. Already they would have been a lot more fractured, they're less confined. There's, they are less of a prospect. We, when speaking to an operator who does this, and they said, oh, well, you know, um, you would just use your freshest, youngest rocks possible to use to use basaltic rocks for storage. So we would tend to favour the ones with the biggest impact. So the, and as we have the benefit of those, and they are offshore in an porous and in porous strata. So it's picking our best rather than having to go to basaltic rocks, unless you want to say something, Ed, there? No, no, that's okay. nothing to add in. Okay, great, we've got just a couple minutes left, so I'll see if we can get through some more questions. Uh, you, this is a question from Ian. He says, you highlight how the seabed could become very crowded with the co-location of offshore wind and storage. This could present a potential challenge to um, MMB plans. Is any is there any ongoing research considering existing and new technologies which would allow co-location? Shall I pick that up, Aileen? Okay. Yes. Yes. Okay. So this is this is uh, this is a lovely question, and and yes, there's a lot of interest and a lot of research. So, um, so when you say it's crowded, and so the to some extent sounds a bit sort of odd, doesn't it? That large area offshore. But the extent of, of geological formations suitable for storage they are very large. Um, similarly, wind farms are similarly large. So there's plenty of concern for co-location, but also then it's an interesting challenge. And so there are many research activities considering how this might be done. So clearly you can't do toad seismic surveys um, weaving in and out of, of, of wind farm pylons, but perhaps you can then look at using um, techniques that use that use the wind sort the, the sort the wind turbines as a source of sound, or you to do your seismic surveys instead, or you would do seismic surveys that do not require um, that do not require um, shipping to be able to tow a seismic source and seismic streamers behind them. So it's a really really interesting challenge. Lots of people are looking at it, particularly things like downhole. Um, downhole uh, monitoring using fiber optic ca cables. So these are, um, you can look at temperature, you can look at strain um, uh, and, and, and pressure. So we're looking at these as well. And also deploying um, um, arrays on the seabed and in the vicinity of injection wells that, that we would use to use the monitoring for conformance with hopefully minimizing the conflict of use. Uh, but, but better still, and with synergies of use, so enable co-location of both wind farms and storage sites offshore. So yes, it's a lovely question, and yes, there's an awful lot of interest in research groups around the UK and, and around um, and globally as well. Okay, a question about collaboration here. We've got just two minutes, so we'll see if we can get two questions in. Are we getting reasonably effective uh, collaboration, cooperation, synergies, cost sharings, et cetera, with Europe on hydrogen and CCUS? Ed, would you be able to say that? Yeah, I think um, in, a, in a nutshell, we probably are. Um, we have active, um, you know, we're active in research projects which are funded by the, the EC and the, and, you know, we have very good, relationships with different partners across across Europe. So I'd say yes, definitely. That's great. So I can, yeah, oh, sorry, so I can also say, yeah, so some of the projects that I, I haven't been able to summarize today were funded by the, the EC. So for example, some of the work that we have done on industrial, uh, industrial source um, carbon capture and storage was led by the Netherlands, of which UK was part. 
and we've been looking at hydrogen and and and, and CO2 storage in a project that was led by by Norway and so on and so on. So we we have yes we have had an awful lot of effective collaboration and cooperation and sharing both with sort of CO2 storage and also for hydrogen as well. Thank you. Okay, just one final question. Deployed large scale installations are required on a time scale of less than five years. How closely are industry involved in planning and system design to achieve this and in estimating costs? Maxine? Okay, so um, so so industry industry are looking very much to be able to look at the effects and the benefits from the projects they already run. We've mentioned two projects in the North Sea already. Well, mentioned one anyway. It's one at Slo well, two two are two are in Norway. Uh, there are one in development, more than one in developed in the, in the Netherlands. Um, and so, what we're looking to is to say um, is to say. Um, is to say how can we benefit from that? So industry, for example, the two storage projects in the, in Norway are both industry led. The Norway Norwegian approach is uh, one that is commercial projects, um, and their government then is um, supports research. So industry are very much very close. Um, where there is nevertheless research that industry cannot do. So I mentioned the CO two storage research facility, um, and would they have been very cooperative with us? to say these are things we cannot do um, because they can't well, compromise our commercial activities, um, but we could you do it? And so, so, we are, so yes, industry is working very closely to be able to deploy um, these large scale projects, uh, but it, we do need to deploy them at pace and at scale if we're going to be able to achieve net zero for the UK. That's great. Thank you very much. Um, that brings us to the end of our session today. Thank you, Maxine and Ed, for your very thought provoking presentations. And thank you, um, everybody, for joining us and for all of your great questions. There are more webinars taking place throughout the week for Net Zero Week. Um, if you visit netzeroweek.com slash business, um, you can get involved there. Thank you very much.